Welcome, everyone. We're really glad to have you here. Um, this is a very important and innovative conversation to make sure that we are continuing to keep art alive and maybe recognizing some of the ways that it shows up as harmful and how to unpack some of that as a community. So that's what we're here for this evening. My name is Amber Cote. I'm the Senior Director of Community Relations for Rocky Mountain Public Media. I'll be your moderator this evening, but I'd like to just say a couple things first. Um, this is a sensitive topic that we'll be talking about this evening. It can be triggering for some folks, so I want to make sure that everyone knows there's an exit there and an exit there if you need to take a break. Um, you can step out to our lobby and just take a few breaths and then join us again. Um, and then just to introduce myself, um, I am a survivor of sexual assault, and I've also been in the field of advocacy for survivors. So this particular discussion is very personal and meaningful to me, and I just feel very honored to be a part of it. And I'm going to invite the rest of our panelists to introduce themselves. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ellie Dean, and I am playing Donna Elvira in this production. Um, I'm looking forward to learning more about how I can better support all the survivors of domestic violence. Hi, everybody. I'm David Lefkowitz. I'm the stage director for this production. Um, as a team, we're really thrilled to have this opportunity to be here, to speak with all of you, uh, and to share our experiences as well. So thanks for having us. Hello, my name is Danielle Paston. I am uh, performing the role of Donna Anna in this production of Giovanni, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, good evening, my name is Lucia McNeil. I am the Client Services Manager at Rose Andam Center. Very excited to be here. Good evening, I'm Rachel Rodriguez. I'm the Associate Director at the Rose Andam Center, and I've been doing this work for about 15 years now. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Scheinbaum and I'm a musicologist. I'm a professor of musicology at the University of Denver's Lamont School of Music. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna watch about a 40 second clip just to set the tone. Thank you. So we're going to start our first questions really with the Opera Colorado team. Um, and we'll start with you, David. As a director, how do you support performers when they're representing these heavy topics? Oh, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, when we show up, some of us have worked together before and some of us have not. Uh, so we're going into this with very little knowledge, very little intimate knowledge of each other. Um, so I sort of have to assume right from the beginning, I don't know everybody, I don't know everybody's past, their truth. Um, so it's important to me to set up right from the beginning that this is a safe place, that they are allowed to take breaks, to egress from the situation and, and take time, that every single choice we make on the stage, everyone has uh, gets to make that choice themselves. I'll, of course, guide that choice making. We have to make the show happen. Mm -hmm. But we want to make sure that people are empowered to be able to portray the characters truthfully <clears throat> that comes from a place of honesty. And so for me, it's very important. Like, it, it's a huge responsibility in those first two days. We, we know we have to stage the show quickly because we, we're rocketing towards the theater. Um, but it's important to take those first couple days and, and sort of ease into the process, identify what can be difficult, talk about the ways that we can work with those difficult themes, and then hopefully with that we have sort of more open environment to ultimately play. Thank you. I'd love to hear from the performers about how you work in these difficult positions in your performances. Sure. Well, I think first we need to be very sensitive to 
our audience, but also um, we have to become intimate with each other very quickly. Um, so we had a great um, intimacy training just the other day where we got to learn each other's boundaries and how to ask for consent. Um, just with some of these difficult scenes, this is a relatively powerful production of what we just saw, um, to make sure that we're all on board with what's going on. So there's nothing that we'll, you will see on stage that we haven't consented to ourselves. And I think that's really important. Uh, but yes, jumping on, on what Ellie said, it's, um, uh, you know, the first couple of days you get in there and you're, you're thrust into these situations really quickly, uh, the situations in the opera very quickly. Um, and, uh, I am fortunate enough to have only worked with wonderful directors like David who are, who are very open about, um, tell me if you're not uncomfortable or tell me if you're uncomfortable, tell me if you, uh, need something to be changed. So having an open dialogue is really important, particularly in the first couple of days. And, and particularly because the first scene in this opera is the big, the big moment. So we, we have to be very open. And as long as we keep that open line of communication, it, 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 it really helps, every, it helps the storytelling and helps us tell the story. Thank you for that insight about the intimacy training that is powerful and interesting to learn. Um, David, as, are there ways that these themes can be presented in less harmful ways as directors are thinking about presenting them every year, knowing what we know about how it can be harmful? Is there some approach that you all can take? As a director, I mean, my job is to tell the story. And so with every story, there are, are good parts, there are bad parts. It's not my story, but it is my story to tell. Um, and it's an enormous responsibility because sometimes you're hired to tell a story that you don't necessarily agree with or like, or I mean, with Don Giovanni, like we would never hopefully find ourselves in these situations. Mm -hmm. um, so are there ways? I mean, absolutely. Um, I think that, that it's about building trust. Mm -hmm right from the beginning with each other and, and allowing that trust to be something that we know, as Ellie was saying, that there are boundaries and we have to play within those boundaries. <clears throat> but I guess my job ultimately is to show the story, but do I have to take it to a level beyond reality? Mm -hmm. I like to think of myself more as a director who tries to find a more human way in, something that is relatable to the audience, <clears throat> so that when you're watching the show, you are watching in some ways yourselves on the stage. Mm -hmm. But again, that's a, an important thing to have. I have the audience's imagination in our hands. We can't abuse that. And so it's very important to me to <clears throat> go to the precipice, but never jump off the edge. There's no reason for grotesque or anything that sort of pushes us into a place where we're forcing these moments to be beyond mm. what they already yeah. are. Um, and so for me as a director, it's really about it's finding that line and, and allowing the performers to go right up to that. We want a fabulous show for the audience. We want people to be entertained, but we have no interest in triggering people or having people feel at the end that they are less than or that we have hurt them in some way. Mm. I mean, opera is a powerful thing with music, with the drama. So we want people to join us on that journey. And the only way to do that is to not abuse them on stage. Thank you. That uh, I'd, I'd love for both of you also to respond to that, but there was a second part to that question, which actually you started to address. Um, what does a director consider when it is likely there are scenes that can be triggering for audience members? Again, it's really tough. I don't know who's in the audience, mm -hmm. so I have to sort of make this accessible for anyone who's coming to see it. Um, I love that there are resources now in the lobby and that we're, we're hearing about that um, during the show there'll be people from the Rosandum Center actually there to provide counsel, to provide support. And this is a new thing. I don't remember doing this the last time I directed Don Giovanni, which is in 2016. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we have to, having these resources is incredibly helpful um, and about really not taking advantage of this powerful position we are in mm -hmm. as performers, as directors, as storytellers, not abusing that. Danielle, Ellie, would you like to speak to that? Either of you? I have just one quick thing to say, especially about both of our characters, is we truly are heroines in this piece. Mm -hmm. So we are survivors. We have been on our own journey and suffered 
very different kinds of abuse um, that I think are these are very relevant today as well. So, um, but we do survive, right? So at the end of the show, uh, we do come out stronger and uh, more powerful. And I think that's something that we can all look forward to, even though the journey can be difficult at times. Um, again, writing on what Ellie said, um, we not only survive, but we we hit the end of the opera. We're swinging. We're still swinging. So it, uh, you know, we end up triumphing uh, at the end of it, which is very powerful. It's also, you know, something to be said for you know what the director's job is, because there are choices that can be made. The you know, from the cast and the directing standpoint, on how empowered these women end up at by the end, and um, what's really fun and really wonderful is when when you end up in a production where the women are very empowered at the end which is what we are putting together thank you it's an ensemble piece sorry to jump right in but it is ensemble piece but we are featuring we have these three female presenting characters and they are the ones who are making choices throughout that lead to their salvation Mm -hmm. to lead to being changed for sure they are not the same as they were before but i like the idea that they're triumphant Mm -hmm. at the end they wear their wounds um, but it's now part of them but they're going to bring that into the next chapter of their life in a in a it makes me teary because it's not an ending where everybody dies at the end which often in opera that happens (laughs) Um, and in this one we we get to sort of reflect on what's happened and decide what we want to do next Mm -hmm. and the choice which earlier had been taken away is now given back Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to address the Rosandum Center staff. Um, Don Giovanni insists that Donna Elvira (laughs) is crazy when she attempts to warn Don Ottavio and Donna Anna about him. How do you see similar situations play out in real life intimate partner violence in your work? Um, we see this quite often, actually. Um, some of the things that come out of Don Giovanni is mental health and talking about um, Donna Alvara, who is crazy. Um, and unfortunately, if someone is experiencing some type of um, anxiety or uh, depression or something similar to that, that gets exacerbated when it is a domestic violence relationship. And so this is really problematic because it's very much victim blaming and it doesn't really focus on what is happening in the relationship and the experience that Donna Elvira is experiencing or any survivor of domestic or sexual violence. Really the first thing that came to my mind was gaslighting, right? Which is, um, it's a psychological tactic that um, is intended to keep the recipient questioning their own reality. And so we can see that in interactions between a person causing harm and a survivor. We can also see that when they're telling, you know, other folks such as third party or friends or family that, hey, this person is crazy. That's a really quick way to write off someone's very real experience. So that's what I thought of. It, literally, we talked about gaslighting in this show all the time. It happens throughout, specifically with Don Giovanni, that he's constantly saying whatever he needs to be able to push his own agenda. And if that is at the expense of someone else, or if he has to say they're crazy, or they're wrong, or don't listen to them, or they're poor, it, whatever he takes, he does. And we see that. It's like the original gaslighting opera. <laughs> and David, since we've gone into a few questions and you have the mic, um, can you just provide? No, no, no. I'm glad that you do. Uh, I want to ask you a question. If you, could, if you could provide a quick sort of summary of the opera in general. Oh, sure. So this is the story of the, Don Giovanni is the story of Don Juan in, in some ways. We have this character who is a seducer of women. And at first you could look at that as like, oh, like, why is that a bad thing? But he is a noble person. He has power, he has money, he has status, and he uses those in every single way to further his agenda. Um, when we first meet him, we are in mid, I mean, it's called a drama jacosa, right? a drama with comedy. But we start in a very sort of For a moment, there's a lightness with Leporello, who is his sort of valet or servant, who is just waiting for him. We don't really know what he's doing, but we have the sense that he's doing something. And then when we do see him, he is being chased out of Donna Anna and the commendatory's house. 
um, he has just abused Donna Anna and she has, when she was sleeping, and she wakes up to him in her room. And we don't see this, but we hear about this later on in the opera. So we only just see this sort of fury that comes in, almost like a tornado that comes in. Um, and her father comes out to protect her and Don Giovanni kills him. And so the opera starts with this intense, bleak darkness. And you think, how is there going to be comedy in this? Like, how can we have funny moments? But it lightens up very quickly when we meet some of our other characters. We meet Elvira, who had been married to Don Giovanni, and he has left her, and she is chasing after him to get him back. <clears throat> she is in love with him and believes him to be in love with her. He is in love with her to a certain extent, but he takes advantage of that situation a lot. Uh, we also meet two other characters, Zerlina and Mazetto, who are peasants, and they're on their wedding day. And Giovanni sees them on their wedding day and sees something he can't have and immediately wants it more than anything. And so convinces his manservant valet Leporello to take the group of peasants and Mazetto, her husband, um, away so that he can have his time with Zerlina. This, of course, is thwarted by Elvira. She comes in and says, I don't think so. This is not happening under my watch. And so begins the sort of uh, the conflict that we have. We have all of these characters who have all been in some way impacted by Don Giovanni um, in terrible ways. And they decide to set a trap that they will hopefully he will fall into and, and to get him, if you will. And act two, we see sort of the product of that chase and a lot of um, arias reflecting on each person's individual story, what has happened and where they are right now. And one of the best things about opera is that you have this fabulous music. So even though some of the themes are, are tough, the music sort of carries you through. And by the end of the story, Don Giovanni's habits have caught up with him and the commendatory who he has killed comes back as a ghost and says, you're gonna invite me to dinner. And John, Don Giovanni says, okay, bring it on, let's do it. And he doesn't expect him to come, but then all of a sudden the commendatory is there and drags Giovanni off to hell. And one would think that the story would sort of end there, you know, like Giovanni is gone, the world can continue. But in fact, that's not the end. The, the other characters come in, and it's not a soft ending. They come in fast and furious, wanting that revenge. And then having to grapple with the fact that that moment of revenge is taken from them. They don't get to necessarily do the, what they would like to do to him. That's been done for them. So now they have to figure out, okay, how do we live our lives now that he's gone, our lives are changed, what do we do next? And they all have this moment where they get to choose what they want to do next. And so in a way, the darkness is replaced by light. And so what I love, again, most operas, and sort of in a really, start in a really happy place and end in a, uh-oh, they're dead again. Um, <laughs> with this one, we have a, a, a total reversal of that. We start with death and end with light. Um, and so for me, there's a, a real catharsis mm -hmm. at the end as I watch. I, I know what's coming, and it's hard to watch as the director. It's, it's hard to watch these things. I have to watch it every day. And although this is incredible singing and brilliant storytelling on all parts, we're still watching it again and again and again and reliving these moments again and again. So there's this great moment at the end when the music sort of becomes major key and, and, and we get to just go, ah, it's going to be okay. And that's a really beautiful way to end a very difficult story. Mm. Thank you. That was such a beautiful summary. Thank you. And I think it's also appropriate to then um, ask our folks from Rose Andam to, to share a little bit about, maybe even provide some standardized definitions of language, even when we talk about gaslighting, um, what that might mean to the audience, and um, summarize the prevalence of intimate partner violence throughout this performance. Sure, um, we can start with prevalence and it's really important to recognize the importance of having the conversations here with um, the intersection of the performing arts and domestic violence because it is very prevalent in our society. We know that in the US, and I've seen stats all over the place, one in four um, women and one in seven men will experience severe physical violence in their lifetime and that's the 
statistic I've been using for years and years and recently just saw one in three women and one in four men uh, from the Center for D Disease Control have come out with that figure. During the pandemic, um, we were actually seeing one in two um, with any type of abuse. Um, typically, it's focused on physical violence, but in during the pandemic, we were seeing a lot more people who were coming to us and became much more prevalent in our society. I can talk about uh, terminology a little bit. I think that's something that's always evolving, right? Um, so some terms that you might hear interchangeably, um, you might hear victim or survivor used interchangeably. Um, I think we should be moving towards using survivor. I think that's a lot more um, empowering and accurate for what someone has experienced. Um, you, there's also a lot of words for people who cause harm or people who use abusive behaviors. We might hear offender or perpetrator or abuser. Um, recently, we've been moving towards person using abuse or person using abusive behavior um, for the reasoning that that places the responsibility on that individual who's choosing mm -hmm. to use that behavior. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. you should come to rehearsal and help us. Okay. <laughs> um, even though Don Giovanni preys on women, the men experience some degree of collateral damage also in this opera. What do you think of the fact that it is ultimately a man who brings him to final justice? That is really complex um, because um, once, one thing I really want to highlight is the fact that we don't promote violence to avenge violence. Um, back in the 18th century when the um, opera took place, this was very normal. However, we know that laws today don't protect those who take um, the law into their own hands. Um, so that's one thing we really wanna focus on. We're not pro further perpetuating the violence. Um, the other thing is we live in a society that is male dominated where men um, more, very patriarchal where more men are making the laws, more men are uh, in a higher stand status. Um, and so women sometimes are not believed. We know that when Donna Alvera tried to warn other women, um, she may not have been believed by the other women because Don Giovanni was saying she's crazy. So um, this is really hard um, in our current society where we see women are less believed um, and men are. We saw even recently in, I don't know, seven weeks of trial in the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case where a very popular act, both two popular actors, but one very, very popular actor who is well liked, his great character, is very good actor who was much more believed in our society than this woman. So it's, it's a struggle. Um, we where we have this difference and we hope that we're making progress. However, and in 2023, we have made progress um, and some recent changes, I feel like we have gone actually backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick note on yeah. it being a male that's bringing uh, Don Giovanni to justice. Um, a thought that I had is we, we often see that um, women um, who've experienced violence or gender-based violence may be sharing their story. It's, it's often not until it is kind of um, endorsed or corroborated by a man saying, hey, listen to this person, that it, we see it taken seriously. Um, and I think we saw some, plenty of that in the Me Too movement a few years back where it wasn't until folks in power, whether that be um, men in general, whether that be folks holding positions of power, um, saying, kind of legitimizing it, that we see it taken seriously. So that was, that stood out. Thank you, I appreciate you making that comment. Um, as we see with Donna Elvira, who's conflicted about her feelings toward Don Giovanni, people who have experienced or witnessed abusive behavior can be very conflicted about how their response should be. And I think we were sort of moving into that in your comments just now. Can you talk about how we see this playing out in your work? It is very common for us to see survivors come forward and feel very conflicted. A lot of them often um, 
drop charges, deny, minimize the abuse uh, because they love their partner, um, however, hate the abuse. And this is where it becomes very conflicted for survivors to move forward. Um, so this is something that we see played out and I'll have Lucia tell you a little bit about some of a direct experience that she had with a client. Yeah, I mean, I just generally, I think when um, we talk about something as complex as intimate partner violence and um, all the things that a survivor may be feeling or experiencing, one thing that I thought of is I think it really gets simplified when we hear things like, well, why don't you just leave? Or why don't they just leave? Um, and I think that really does a... I think that's really an inaccurate way to view such a complex issue when there are so many different emotions when, like Rachel said, someone may hate the abusive behavior but still very much love that partner and that's incredibly complicated. And then, I mean, I could talk about this for a long time, but like, we talk about all kinds of other barriers. Financial abuse is a big one that comes to mind, but. Yeah, I, I would actually wouldn't mind at all giving you a few more minutes to talk about some of the complexity because I think that is one of the things that comes up the most is people not understanding why someone doesn't leave or or how often um, victims are blamed. Um, it sounded like that is also a theme in this opera. Yep. Do you want to say any more about that? Sure. I mean, this this is extremely complex and a lot of society recognizes the most obvious when we have the physical violence we see the the bruising we see the broken bones however the less subtle types of abuse are as lucia start you know started sharing is the financial abuse is what we see very very often uh, because of so many different reasons there's so many barriers that include financial that includes um resources or um, maybe not uncertain to their resources or even that um, especially in cultures that don't even know that this is a crime that it is unlawful to be able to have domestic violence sexual violence especially in a um, marriage the barriers may include um, things culture uh, culturally maybe somebody experiencing a um, person with a disability who has difficulty leaving that relationship because they are dependent on their caretaker who happens to also be their intimate partner these are so so complex we could go on <laughs> and on about the different complexities of the challenges of leaving their abusive partner and sometimes people come to us and really are uncertain because of the power and control that are um, put over them and they don't even know what to do and come to us you know you know asking and figuring out and as advocates what we do is we we provide options we talk and educate them about the understanding of domestic violence so that they can be empowered to make those their decisions on their own just one last thought on sure. that what I would really love to see happen instead of um, society asking why don't you just leave start asking why is this person using abusive behaviors or why do abusers abuse? The, I think that's the question we should be focused yeah. on. Yeah, thank you. I feel like, did you have something you wanted to add? I mean, I always want to talk. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I was just thinking about all of the things that you just said literally play out in this opera. The financial dependence, the, the uh, I, we have one character, Donna Anna, who it happens to her right in the beginning of the story and then we see her the next day, and she's in mourning for her father, but we don't actually see the abuse right away. And it, it takes time for it to actually come out. And so each character sort of, it, I think again, what I love about this opera is that each character is different. So they each get to bring a different truth to the table. And each one has a different reason why they can't leave. Like Donna Elvira, loves him and believes that he loves her back and will be there for her. And it's this sort of, it sort of drives her through the whole story. It, it, why is this guy abusing her is the question we want to ask instead of why is she staying with him for so long? And yet it's still, that is a question that I get asked all the time. Well, why would she stay with him? Mm. That for me is actually more relatable than why would somebody do the abuse in the first place? Mm. So I just, I, 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 I like the fact that it's an opera written so long ago, and yet it, it's still so relevant to today. Uh, and that, that is not always the case with some of our older operas where we have to let them um, go for a little bit before we bring them back. 
in a new context. Danielle, Ellie, do you have thoughts as we've been talking about this with the Rosandum team? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a great opportunity also. I mean, Donna Elvira has been love bombed, right? So she's living in this whole intoxicated mode that she doesn't see this narcissistic narcissistic abuse, right? Um, and so it's hard to see clearly sometimes until you see abuse happening to someone else and then someone else and then it, in a different way. Um, so it's very eye-opening too to just put yourself in these characters' shoes. It might be difficult, but um, it's fascinating for me. I've, I, I think both Danielle and I have played both roles, um, Anna and Elvira, so it's very interesting to revisit the other character um, and, and just think and they all stand up to today, every single, every single issue. I, I also think that it's interesting. Uh, Anna um, has, ex she's the one that experiences the, the physical abuse because he she wakes up with him in in her room um she's actually believed which is an interesting uh, uh, uh an interesting aspect of the of the show when she does finally come out with what what has happened to her don otavio does believe her so that that is a nice um that is a nice representation it's worth you know mm -hmm. worth mentioning that not every character is, is right. evil in this story, right. that some have redeeming qualities right. that actually are there to help. Right. Jack. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so I, I, we, we have you situated there uh, on purpose because it sort of brings it all back to then the music of this opera. So how do you see elements of the plot being represented in Mozart's music? Right, and I mean, it's important to say, right, but the opera is effective not only because the libretto, the words are so good, but because Mozart does such a good job representing all of these characters and all of the psychological nuance that is going on with these characters throughout the opera. So it's a very, it's a tricky issue. It's a, it's a thorny and thick issue. The, um, the opera, the full title of the opera, right, is The Rake Punished or Don Giovanni. And so right, the framing of the opera right at the beginning is that Giovanni is a bad guy. He is going to be punished, right? So it's, it's set up from the beginning. But at the same time, the opera sits in Mozart's catalog um, as sort of opera buffa, kind of comic opera. And so it's, some of these situations are played for humor. Um, and some of the, so the way that some of this plays out is very, very tricky. Um, at a, let's say, a really deep level, uh, David brought this up before, is that there is the language of comic opera, but then there's also the language of serious opera that's there, and different characters kind of sing and act in these different registers that are there. And one of the things that's interesting about Giovanni as a character is that he is the character that can kind of move among these worlds. So he can sing with the lower class characters when he wants to. He can sing with the upper class characters when he wants to. And so again, that's something that's very interesting to see and sort of um, as a musicologist, it's interesting to see this, but it also is a tool of his abuse. He's able to be a predator because he's able to communicate with these characters, right, on the level that they want to be communicated with. Um, and then as the opera goes on, again, it gets, it's very tricky. There are certain numbers, one of the most famous numbers in the opera, um, Giovanni's servant, Leporello, sings what is known as this catalog aria. And so um, he has literally a book where he has recorded the thousands of women that Giovanni has slept with. And the women in that number are really, they are treated like objects. You know, Mozart throws in little humorous descriptions as Leporello talks about tall women and short women, skinny women, fat women, women from different nationalities. And Mozart throws in these little musical descriptions that are there and it's kind of played for laughs. Um, and so it's a very, very tricky thing to, um, to, to get around, yet at the same time, um, as, the, as the performers have been talking about, the women in the opera really have a three-dimensional subjectivity to them all the way through. And so this is why it's hard, in it, or you, um, Mozart is doing some very complex kinds of things where there's certain situations played for laughs, at the other time there's a lot of kind of pathos that's there. Um, and then one other example of this, let's say like in the music is when the country girl, girl Zerlina, is being, we'll call it sort of seduced by Giovanni, there's this music of seduction. Mozart really plays it as seductive music rather than predatory 
kind of music, right? Giovanni sings sort of a paragraph in the music, and then Zerlina sings the same music back to him, right? So there's this, there's this interaction that's sort of at the same level that's happening. And then Giovanni sings half of a line, and Zerlina sings it, sort of, you know, completes the line, and then they sing together in harmony, right? So Mozart is depicting this seduction that happens. Yet at the same time, near the act one, near the end of the first act, when Giovanni attacks Zerlina, the music turns very serious and the music suddenly changes. Zerlina is screaming at the top of her register. The music suddenly shifts to very sort of agitated minor mode. Um, and so you can tell right away this is a serious situation. So Mozart sort of treats these in very, um, in serious ways at times, but at the same time, there's also this comic edge that's there, which can be, can be tricky to deal with. Wow, thank you. I'm so glad you're here to talk about <laughs> the music and, and just how important it is in creating that environment and the feeling. Um, we talked just before we got started uh, about what else would you like to share from your perspective about this opera as it relates to the theme of our discussion. But I think you also have a big picture perspective that you might want to bring to the conversation. Sure, I mean, you know, from the, the big picture, right, Giovanni is one of the most famous operas, but opera in general, right, it's been around for over 400 years, and these kinds of stories and situations are all over opera, and it's very tricky, right, because on one hand, there is this glorious music, and very often from women characters, you know, so um, you, you leave the theater, and these are the tunes that you're singing. This is what's stuck in your head, or these sort of immortal women, and yet at the same time, we see in the history of opera over and over again that these women characters are killed. You know, often it's, it's, um, it's, it's a, not a nice way to say it, but there's this ritualized murder that we are seeing for our entertainment on stage and so it's very difficult to think about sort of on one hand they're immortal on the other hand we're being entertained by watching this slaughter happen um, and this is true i think you know even more widely in classical music it's it's october um, right now and so lots of orchestras let's say one of the most famous symphonies that orchestras will play is uh, by the french composer hector berlioz the symphony fantastique um, and it's because there's this sort of spooky music at the end. So it's, you know, great for Halloween concerts and things like this. And so, again, all of this music is played sort of like for lighthearted fun. You know, this kind of spooky Halloween music. But at the same time, the story that is there in the symphony that the composer wants the audience to know is this grotesque story about a protagonist who is obsessed with a woman and who has not, never met the woman but is obsessed with her. And when... He, he thinks that, well, she must not really love him, he then imagines murdering her. Um, and so it's, again, very sort of thick and difficult to think about the fact that we, in society, are entertained over and over again by um, these fantasies of, of murdering women and seeing it depicted on stage over. So this, this doesn't happen in Giovanni, but the, but the predatory behavior, the, the abuse that is there is, is very difficult. Thank you. Can I add or ask, do you think that's also, um, uh, because there are a lot of, I, I have often joked that I rarely make it to the end of an opera alive. I'm almost always dead by the end of an opera, <laughs> but not always by murder. Sometimes I, I'm dying of consumption or something, something like that. <laughs> right. Very very often I'm, I'm theoretically wasting away to, to nothing. Do you think that the, the trend for composing uh, the, the female characters also dying that way is also uh, part of the whole ritualistic right. uh, m murdering of women, even though these women are sick? Right. Yeah, I mean, if it's, uh, right, it might be a supernatural force, but it is the same sort of thing, right, that stereotypical story. It comes out in the 19th century novel as well, right, the, the story of sort of a woman who, um, let's say, does not stay in her place and therefore either repents or gets sick and dies or is murdered, you know, and it's, yeah, yeah. it's, really, it's really difficult to... Um, to, to grapple with it. I mean, what I love so much about the fact that we're doing this tonight is that I, my own personal view is not to advocate for not performing mm -hmm. these works, but instead to confront the 
difficult yes. issues in the works and to, and to talk about them and to think, right, critically about how to stage these sorts of works. Um, I mean, one thing that's really been on my mind, if, um, if it's okay to mention, I was reading, there's a, a wonderful book by uh, University of Virginia musicologist Richard Will called Don Giovanni Captured, and he studied, um, just from last year, and he studied all the recordings of Giovanni over the last century and all the films of Giovanni um, that have been released. And even in the 20 film productions of Giovanni since 2000, right, so just in our generation right now, over half of them depict Donna Anna as sort of conspiring with Giovanni, as lying to her fiance. And so it's yeah. really interesting to see that there, even today, that Giovanni can still be staged in a way, and very often is staged, right, in this way where um, Giovanni's behavior is excused in many ways. Yeah. Well, because you don't see it. And sorry. <laughs> because you don't, for in Anna's case, you don't see you just ha you have to take her word for what has happened, right? So I think with that, I would just love for the mic to come all the way back and just for each of you to respond to what Jack just said, if you don't mind. Jack, I think you really brought up an important part of something that I had been thinking about when I started watching um, and preparing for the, the, and watching Don Giovanni is to really share with you that we're not here to shame you for supporting the opera. Um, what I think is important to recognize is the fact is that we see domestic and sexual violence played out in many, many mediums. Whether you're listening to songs, where you're watching television, watching movies and supporting books and wherever medium that you support, I think the important thing for us to be thinking about is um, how we see this played out and let's have that discussion. And this is why it's really important to be having this discussion now, October's Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we need to be talking about the intersection so that we're not normalizing these types of behaviors and perpetuating the domestic and sexual violence. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for making that point. I think there's a lot to be said all of how all types of media nowadays, um, music or movies or, you know, um, often we are using violence, particularly violence against women as a form of entertainment. Um, and I, you know, I think we could probably talk about that for a lot longer than an hour, but that's definitely thought provoking. I think I probably technically already uh, responded, but uh, you know, in the, in the uh, <laughs> I will add, I will just throw this out there that um, it, the, the saying art imitates life, it's a very, that's a very true statement. And I think it's uh, particularly relevant for this discussion and uh, very true for the show. Do you need to, how many <laughs> microphones do you need? <laughs> <laughs> All, so many wonderful points. I mean, I think uh, I just always go back to sort of m my role as the director and like is to tell stories. And it's it's hard to say, but I want those stories to to capture the imagination of the audience. I want people to want to see these stories. Um, I don't want to trigger people. I don't want people to leave upset. But we do want to we want to show truth on stage. And so the truth comes from good places and bad places. And it's important for both to exist and to have a place to exist. I'd rather there be, I'd rather us not hide and, and put it away and not talk about it. I'd rather be, I'd rather be discussing it. I'd rather be on stage and be there for, to provoke a discussion, to make these sort of panels happen, to allow us a space to talk about it. Um, when I was growing up, it felt like you didn't, you weren't supposed to talk about these things, and and your job was to just smile and and move on and and just make it work. It's going to be fine. And I don't want to anymore. And one of the reasons why I love directing is that I put my own truth and and the performers' truths on that stage in a respectful way, in a in a beautiful way, but in a way that 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 is and honors them and honors their truth. But it's still important and. and I think it's a huge responsibility we have, but it's one that I, I don't take lightly and and love. I love my job. Um, I can, my own catharsis gets to be on that stage too. And so I think that's important. 
I mean, there's so many great things that have already been said. I think the biggest thing um, to highlight is I, I've been involved in a lot of these productions, many in Europe, which are so shocking you would not believe the more blood the more uh, i will say those are usually sold out um, just because of the shock value you see game of thrones the ratings are higher than ever so i think what opera colorado is doing here is the right choice is we're presenting a very traditional version of an incredible i mean it's a prodigic masterwork of a piece um, and having the conversation at the same time right so we can take this body of work and and confront the tough issues and still allow people to experience the sublime music. I think it's possible to do both, and I think they're doing it with a great eye forward. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have one more question about resources available, but I want to go to the audience first. Um, Sarah, can we um, invite the audience to ask questions? Sarah will bring a mic to you. Or <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think this is mostly for Jack, but uh, others of you may have some unexpected insights. Uh, five years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to visit Prague for the first time for both of us. And the um, particularly unexpected pleasure of being able to attend a production of Don Giovanni in the house in which it premiered, um, and which also features substantially in the movie Amadeus. And so I have been mulling ever since about what was that like in 1788? Um, uh, who's the audience? Do we have any record of whether it was more of just a comic opera or the kind of grisly pastiche that we saw from Sydney? Uh, how, do, how did society take that kind of stuff 230 years ago? Yeah, I don't know how much um, detail I've I've got or, or can go into, but one thing is that the um, uh, the these sort of genre questions are really interesting to think about. The idea that if it's presented, you know, sort of in Mozart's catalog, it's like a comic opera, and yet it begins with a murder, and um, and both of the uh, the cast members that we have on stage are playing characters that sing very often in this opera in the language of more serious opera. So there is something there where an audience is going expecting a certain kind of entertainment and then gets something else. You know, and so Mozart, I think, is very aware of this, that he is messing with expectations. Um, and, and I think that's part of you know, why, let's say, we're still interested in Giovanni today, even if we're not caught up in those same expectations of this sort of opera or that sort of opera. But there's a sort of three-dimensionality, I think, that comes from having um, the story sort of not just thinly be comic opera or just be a grotesque you know, serious opera where everyone is, is dead on stage, you know, um, at the end. I mean, I love the point that in this opera we start with a murder and then we end with, um, uh, with, you know, metaphorical light, you know, going on. And that's such a nice shifting, again, of the expectations, right, that, that would happen. Yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, there are other things to go into the, that, that closing number in the opera, which was there at the premiere, but then we know in the early history, later, ver later shows in Prague in 1787, it seems like, and in Vienna the next year, they didn't, they didn't perform that last number. It just kind of ends with Giovanni like being dragged to hell, you know, and that's the end. But now it's much more common, right, to stage that last number and to, to say it's not just about the supernatural force, right, but it's the community that is coming together to bring Giovanni to justice, you know, which is such a, a wonderful way of, of ending the production. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, well, I just want to say that I love opera. I'm an opera singer myself from Mexico. I'm singing with the Colorado Symphony. Mm -hmm. So I hope Don Giovanni and all the operas never stop being presented. But I'm wondering, um, the life uh, affects art, 
and art affects life. So we as a society, as a world, we have been affected and we are changing our um, uh, terminology or words. We are changing our ways of life. We don't accept this abuse anymore. We wanna change the, the world. So what is being doing, because I don't know, I don't have the answer. It's a reflection and it's an ans a question. What the opera world is doing to present new stories new operas, new music. I would want to sing Donna Anna someday, but I, I also wa would want to see an opera where women it's empowered, where the women is not abused, when this new language is used so me and the new generations could have you know a new perspective. The world has been changed by songs, operas, uh, pictures, and art in general, you know, there there has been like uh, highlights where artworks have changed the world. So could it be the opera, new composers, new operas that could change the world? Do you have some information about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm not the composer, thank goodness, because I'm <laughs> it's just not my thing. Um, but what's been very interesting, at least for me, I've been working in the opera business for over 20 years, and I started my career at the Metropolitan Opera, and that was a company then that only produced traditional operas in a traditional way. And occasionally they would have like one production that was sort of, it would be Don Giovanni set in a totally different time period. It was, like, oh my gosh. Um, and what they realized right at the beginning of COVID, or right before COVID actually, was that those operas were no longer selling tickets. And so the war horses, we call them, like Traviata, Don Giovanni, Cosi Fan Tutte, um, all of a sudden they were our, our staple. And then without them, without them selling tickets, what are we gonna do? And I looked to the Met because they, their combined total of the next five largest opera companies still does not equal what the Metropolitan Opera spends in a year. So they are a dominant force, not only in the opera world, in America, but in the entire world. I mean, they help, they are not the end all be all, but they do set a standard. And recently they have started programming more modern operas, especially to open the season. This is again, unheard of until now. So I think change is happening. As always, it's slow. It's not what we want it to be. It, 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 we always have an idea of what it could be, but I am starting to see it. And that's thrilling. Um, even just this past year, I got I, I direct mostly operas with with the f female characters don't make it to the end and large productions and the war horses. But I had the pleasure of directing a production of As One, an opera about a trans experience. And again, this is the most commonly performed new opera of our time, except for I think Dead Man Walking and As One are are the two most performed operas, new operas. And it was thrilling. This audience didn't they didn't know it. They didn't know what was going to happen at the end. Um, so I think change is coming, it's happening, it's just we're in it. And it's hard to write about the snow when it's snowing. Um, but I do think we're gonna look back and see this time as a, as a very important shift from doing everything the same way for 400 years, we're finally into a new era. I think we have time for one quick question, if there's one more. Um, just speaking about change, uh, I just wanted to touch on the topic about like males being the survivors of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, I just wanted to ask, this might be a general question, but I'm not really familiar with John Giovanni or anything like that. That's why a reason I came tonight. Um, so it's been great to learn about everything, but I just wanted to ask about what are the sort of changes that you might have seen with males being dominantly the survivors of domestic violence and how that might be changing things and if any male actor was portrayed in John, Don Giovanni at all? Because I have not seen that play, so I just kind of wanted to touch on that because it is a sensitive topic and I know we are trying to push more for males to come out and speak about their personal experience, so I just wanted to hear about what your opinions are about that. Well, I can certainly from the Don Giovanni perspective, we have one character, Mazzetto, who is the, as I mentioned before, that's Serlina's husband. They just got married. And Don Giovanni actually beats him uh, within an inch of his life in Act Two. Um, and it's, it's not hidden off stage. It's not something that's talked about. It's fully on display. It's not comedic. It is, it's, it's pretty gory. 
Um, and Zerlina comes in and sees that. And what I love about this scene is that she's been sort of like a younger, not naive, but somewhat innocent, but also knows what she's doing, you know, not too innocent. But I, I should look at that as sort of like a young feeling, younger quality. And when she sees the man that she's married, and she sees that the result of what's happened to him, it changes her. And then she sings this whole aria, she has two verses, and you feel in the second verse she's almost grown up and, and sort of come into her own. Um, and so it, in a way, it's in a way where you're going to see something like that from an opera so long ago. Um, I, I can't speak to too many operas in modern day where the male protagonist is, is you know, I'm, I'm sure there are some, I'm just blanking on them right now. Um, but it certainly is a topic that should be discussed, should be put on stage. Rachel, I also think that uh, you had some thoughts about that you'd like to respond, and then you can hand the mic over to Jack as well. Yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize that um, as a society and in the field of domestic violence, we have seen that shift happen where um, we are completely inclusive of all identities that come forward um, to, um, to provide them the services that they need. Our society is still needing to catch up um, because it is underreported for those who identify as male to come forward and report because sometimes the abuse might look different. The abuse might be more emotional, might be more um, financial or psychological, and do you call the police when you're being yelled at? Um, and so law enforcement may not always be um, the place where they might go forward to report. However, they do come to us, and we have seen an uptick in survivors who identify as male coming forward. And this has been um, a great um, shift, especially in our shelters, domestic violence shelters, where we do now make it inclusive for all identities. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done uh, because of how our views, our beliefs, our attitudes are towards um, survivors who identify other than female. Uh, we are completely inclusive in how we um, support our survivors of domestic violence. Can you hand Jack the mic? Thank you. Well, I just, I mean, David mentioned this and right to answer your question. So one of the operas that the Met has premiered right recently and um, has, you know, they are, um, is, is just a huge hit is Terrence Blanchard's Fire Shut Up In My Bones, right, which is based on Charles Blow, the, uh, the New York Times columnist memoir, and that is a story that centers, you know, sort of autobiographically for him on his abuse, right, as a child and how he deals with it as he, as he comes of age. And so to see it on the stage of the Met and, and um, you know, to be such a, a huge hit, right, to open their season right after the pandemic, right, they opened with there. that I was there, I forgot production. about that one. You're right, yeah. Jack. Like, I completely forgot, but that's a perfect example. And it was a huge success. Thank you. Um, I have one more question. Uh, what are the resources available at the performance and beyond? Do you want to start off? <laughs> sure. Um, so we will have a resource advocate um, or other employee from Roseanne Center present for each show. Um, that's to provide education as well as to serve as emotional support if that's needed by an audience member. Um, beyond, I mean, I, I know you worked at the hotline. <laughs> yeah, so we know that the performance is um, done worldwide, and anyone who is attending or the performance is being placed elsewhere, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is a good resource to connect to because they can get you connected to um, services in your area. Um, but at, like Lucia said, the Roseanne Center is a great place um, to get connected to first. And we do have brochures. We will have several staff members from the Roseanne Center to answer any questions that you have or if you know someone experiencing domestic violence or you may have experienced it yourself, we are definitely a place that we are here to support you as well. And you'll be at every performance. We will be at every performance. We will have someone to not only provide the information, but if you are triggered or someone that is there at the performance that is triggered can process with an advocate. Thank you. Thank each and every one of you for being here this evening. This conversation has been critical, um, thought-provoking, and also stirring in our hearts. So I appreciate your time and um, thoughtfulness in this conversation. And thank you all for being here tonight.